My friends, welcome to another video. I want to address a common misconception among those who want to read research papers and have an evidence-based nutrition and exercise approach. And essentially, it comes down to black and white thinking. You're either with me or against me. A gray area in between? No doesn't exist. I want to start with an analogy and then I'll explain how it applies to, for example, nutrition research. Imagine you're being accused of killing your partner. Carol Baskin killed her husband, whacked him. Can't convince me that it didn't happen. Fed them to tigers, they snacking. What's happening? You are arrested and you'll have to appear at a trial. Now, there are two possible outcomes of this trial. The jury either finds you guilty or not guilty. So that's a very black and white scenario. It's either this or that. And there's no gray area in between. Now, during the trial, it turns out there is no DNA evidence, there is no video footage, and there are no witnesses. So basically, there is nothing that can prove that you did it. And a rule we have in the justice system is that you're innocent unless it's proven that you're guilty. Since in this case, there is not enough evidence that you did it, the jury has no choice other than to find you not guilty. So the verdict of the trial is not guilty, but has this trial now proven that you're not guilty, that you didn't do it? No. Let's say you actually did it. You killed your partner. Then by definition, it cannot be proven that you're innocent because you did it. A lack of evidence for being guilty is not proof of evidence of being innocent. Innocence is just the default conclusion when there's not enough evidence for guilt. So what would be considered proof of innocence? Let's say that you can demonstrate in this trial that on the day of the murder, you were on holiday and you have evidence that you booked into a flight to another country. You have evidence that you booked into the hotel in that other country. And there's a video footage of you playing in the casino at the time of the murder. Now you have really demonstrated that you couldn't have possibly done it. If there's no evidence, you'll be fined not guilty. If you can present this evidence that you're innocent, the verdict will be the same, not guilty. But now you've taken away all the remaining doubt. Okay, so what does all of this have to do with evidence-based nutrition? Well, the same concept applies here. Most research studies use statistics that will come to the conclusion that a statistically significant difference is observed or that no statistically significant difference is observed. In line with the justice system, clear convincing data needs to be presented um, before the conclusion that there is a significant difference can be made. Otherwise, uh, the default conclusion is there is no significant difference. Also in line with the justice system is that no significant difference simply means there's not enough evidence of a significant difference. It does not mean that it's now shown that, for example, two treatments have produced exactly identical re results or are equivalent, as we would say. So when you read a study that observes no significant difference between treatments, you should not read that as this study has proven that all these treatments produce identical results. You should read it as, oh, this study has a conclusion in the gray area. There's not enough proof to a conclusion either way. 
Now in the justice system, we have an easy way wrapping our hats around the idea that someone can be guilty, but that maybe we haven't found enough proof to show it in court. But why would a research study not be able to find a statistical significant difference um, for example, between two different diets, uh, when in fact one diet is superior to the other? Well, there are many possible reasons. For example, a small sample size, um, insensitive measurements, uh, a short study duration, and many more. Let's use a small sample size as an example. Unfortunately, Many studies only have a relatively small amount of subjects. And if you have a small amount of subjects, you'll only end up with a relatively small data set. And a relatively small data set is almost by definition not a very convincing data set. Even if one of the diets appears superior to the other, um, you might still wonder, did this happen by chance? Um, what if I included more subjects? Would you still see the same? While if you include a million subjects in both groups, then of course that doubt would be taken away. And this uncertainty about a uh, low number of subjects is taken into account with statistics. So studies with a small sample size very often end up in this gray area of no clear proof of a conclusion either way. Now, there are many more factors that influence the statistics of a study. And if that sounds interesting to you, we've written a very comprehensive blog post with a lot of practical examples that explains all of that. And you can find the link in the description below. But for this video, the main message I want you to remember is that when a study concludes no significant difference between treatments, that does not mean that it has shown that these treatments produce identical results. I hope our guilty versus not guilty analogy has made this a bit more clear. Most statistical concepts are quite logical once you get it. Um, but often we need a practical example to wrap our heads around it. So thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Did you know that when you like, subscribe and comment on this video, you are significantly more awesome than people who don't?